I'm delighted to welcome today Stephen Rummelsberg, who's joining me to have a conversation about education in general and probably specifically Catholic education. So I think we'll be comparing notes from my perspective in the UK here, based in London, and uh, your perspective from what's happening over there in America. And you are Senior Fellow at the Cardinal Newman Society and many other things. So, hi, how are you? Good morning, Catherine. I'm great. And thank you for having me. How are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I'm really glad that you could join me. So do you want to tell us a bit about this role that you have at the uh, Cardinal Newman Society? Yes, um, it's going to be a little bit anticlimactic because I was hired last year by the Cardinal Newman Society. Uh, and I had done some work with them a little bit before I got hired. But when I got hired, they discovered that since I work in California, they would be subject to California labor law. So even though I'm hired by the Cardinal Newman Society, I'm holding off on my work till I move to Texas, which is this month. So when I move there, what, my, what I'll be doing as a senior fellow is I'll be working on documents that help outline uh, protocols and ways that we should approach Catholic education. So it's a really, really important calling. And yeah. um, even though I've been doing it informally with the Cardinal Newman Society, I will be doing it formally very shortly. And it's yeah. all intertied with my other work that I'm doing. It seems like a good point to ask you, what is the purpose of Catholic education as you see it? <laughs> well, that's a huge question. I, I think in the simplest terms, we would say to colonize heaven, to lay out the process by which people become citizens in the city of God. And I don't think that would make much sense to the world today. Unfortunately, in the United States, and I suspect in the UK as well, the Catholic schools appear to be competing with the public schools. And the mission of the public school is purely materialistic. It's a social mission rather than a spiritual one. So the authentic Catholic school has to be spiritual. Yeah, we... So over here, we have um, state Catholic schools. So mm. I work in a state Catholic school. So it's not a private, you don't have to pay for it. So anybody can attend a local Catholic school. Oh. Um, and, but we have, I would say problems in Catholic education that maybe is similar to, to, to that you have over there. I know that you don't, you don't have state funded Catholic schools, no? We don't have state-funded Catholic schools. I know that Canada does, and, and you guys do. Um, but it hasn't stopped most of our Catholic schools from competing with the secular humanist schools. Yeah. Um, and I suspect it's not quite as bad as what's going on there, but I think it's the same kind of thing. Modern ideologies are seeping in, and uh, even staff members at Catholic schools in general aren't terribly faithful. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Uh, my sense is that it's just the smoke of Satan blanketing everybody. And we've just been slowly, incrementally being led down the path of deceit to where we've inverted the order of goods. So what is literally demonic is now promoted in society as virtue. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I believe many of us have been, been kind of fooled. I think we're unaware that when we're promoting vicious and demonic things as good, we're doing something terribly wrong and it just doesn't seem like it anymore. Mm. Yeah, there's no confidence, it seems. Even, I can't speak for all Catholic schools, but over here, I feel like there's a there's a fear. There's always that fear of um, being told that you are hateful or discriminatory or a bigot for right. really just, for really just um, having the confidence in your faith. I don't know if you're familiar with um, over here recently, there was a story that broke where a school in Croydon, which is a borough just ar around London, um, a, a Catholic school invited a, an author to the school. And the author identifies as gay, but that isn't the point. He writes um, what he would say is LGBT fiction uh, mm. for, young, for young adolescents. And right. he was invited in to kind of promote this book and maybe as far as I know, like uh, maybe give young people the opportunity to purchase it. It was like a book, a World Book Day event. So, nice. so he was invited in by somebody in the school, and I don't know who, but th this is a Catholic school. And nice. then the um, diocese uh, looked at the the book and what was being promoted, and said that the speaker should not come in. Right. 
Right. Now, like there's been a huge storm over this. So the teachers are going on strike and saying, so the narratives that's been spun is because he's a gay man, he, he's been, he hasn't been welcomed into school. And so the Catholics are bigots and they're discriminatory. And that isn't the case at all. It's, it's nothing to, like if he was coming into the school to fix the photocopiers or to whatever, do the garden or the plumbing, he'd, people would have made him a cup of tea, sat down, had a chat with him. It's not about who he, I don't, who he is. Do you see what I mean? But that pressure, no. that cultural no. pressure, even in a Catholic school, has been to, to say you cannot. It's funny because you've got this right to religious freedom. But then when you try and live authentically and teach the faith, there's this pressure that says, no, you can't. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, there's a web of 10,000 lies around that story, which is interesting because <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. I'm sure that man would be welcome anywhere in the school. What the, what the diocese is saying he's not welcome to do is come in and promote a sin that cries out to heaven for vengeance. Mm -hmm. That's, am I, am I reading that right? Yeah. As far as I know, you know what, Stephen, it's, it's vulgar, but I think maybe it's it's important to to maybe give you and anyone watching an idea of what's in the books. Would you mind? Please. If I do. So so one of the big concerns is that in one of the books, the books that this author was coming to promote, um, there are there's a parody of the Lord's Prayer and mm. it begins. Let us pray. Our father, who art the gay boy. Noah is his name. He makes Harry come. He gives him one on earth as it is in heaven and lead him straight into temptation, right into a gay bar. For Noah is a gay boy who likes to suck. Forever and ever he's gay. I'm not comfortable reading that, but at the same that time, is that is right. But at the same time, this is the reality of what was intending to be promoted at, our, at a Catholic school. A Catholic school would allow that blasphemy. Wow. Right. I, but, I'm utterly shocked. You, <laughs> Catherine, you have shocked me. It okay. is shocking. It is shocking. Wow. But, I live in California. I'm shocked. <laughs> and you're shocked even though you live in California. It I'm is shocking. Shocked. But the, mm. the, 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 the archbishop stepped in, you know, and all credit to the diocese, um, the archbishop right. and the um, education commission stepped in and said, you know, there are times where things that are being taught fall outside of the remit of what's permissible and acceptable yeah. and referred to our constant teaching of the church. So that, you know, so that's a that's a good sign of hope that actually yes. they did step in and say, no, this isn't permissible. But it doesn't stop the fact that there's been this big backlash this, this backlash and really how unfortunate how deeply sad that anyone who might be able to call themselves catholic would promote such a thing this man if we're being charitable needs our prayers this man needs our help and how sad that the response instead of wanting to help him charitably is to promote the, the disorder that he's trying to propagate mm -hmm. it's really tragic mm -hmm. When you first brought up the story, what I was thinking was, is that this is also a huge problem is, is the idea that somebody is gay is actually not possible. That's a, an abuse of speech. The fact is there's no such thing as gay as an ontological category. The fact of the matter is that this man, whoever he is, is a human person and he's a male human person. And that's what he is. Mm -hmm. And when we say something like, a person is gay, we're saying something that's called a paronym, not a noun. It's not an ontological category. It's, it's a shortcut to telling us something about the activity of the man. The man chooses to participate in, in, in this type of lifestyle. Therefore, we refer to that as a gay lifestyle, but he's actually not even a gay person. So to promote saying something like, this is who he is, is, is an abuse of speech. And that's one of the grounds from which they began to confuse us. So I think we need to recover the truth of speech if we're going to deal with this authentically in the Catholic school. Mm. It's difficult. How do you go about it? Oh, <laughs> well, that's another thing is that the schools eliminated philosophy. And the, the thing I just described was an assumption about the nature of reality. And that's the thing not spoken about. So the thing we ought to recover is first the word nature. Mm. What does the word nature mean? In the Catholic school, 
nature or any school today, nature is likely to be something materialistic like mother nature, trees and what's out there. When in reality, nature in an intellectual sense is the playing field of potential activities of a thing or its essence or its real formal cause. So if we were going to begin to resolve this, we would have to return to an authentic notion of intellectual philosophy, which is what all teachers should do anyway, especially Catholic teachers. Yeah. That's the thing right is, again. Catholic schools remain really popular over here. You know, they're mm. always amongst the most popular. As I've said, they're already uh, free, they're state, state schools. So um, what you find here is that families will start taking their children to church from a young age with the, expressly with the intention of wanting them to get into the Catholic education. And I know that, that the priest will say it's good because at least they're coming to church. And I agree with that. Um, mm. But if that they're coming to church to get the child into school and then the child gets into school and then they have no further relationship or formation with their faith, then that's the problem. I think formation is really the problem, isn't it? Sure, sure. And that's, again, the ground. What's the ground of the Catholic school? If it's not truth or the end is truth and the ground is truth, if that's not the case, then it's not even a Catholic school. It's Catholic in name only. Right. right. Yeah, I guess. So what, yeah. what identifies it differently from any other school? Exactly. What, yeah, if they're promoting things like that or if they're not going into... See, see, a Catholic school must be theology is the womb. The revealed truth right. is the biggest, most profound kind of truth we can encounter. Philosophy is a handmaiden. And the way into philosophy and theology are the liberal arts. These are the most prof profoundly humane and human arts known to man that perfects him and prepares him to understand the revealed truths and the philosophical truths that we know. That characterizes a Catholic school. If those things are absent, it could only be Catholic in name only. Yeah. So how how will you how do you go about building that sort of program? What I suppose at the moment I see like the emphasis is really on exams. So oh we'll have students we'll have students saying to me like over here we've got our GCSEs next week so they their, their big end of year exams start next week mm -hmm. and for quite a while if you teach something they'll say is this in the exam and, and right. they don't want to know if it's not in the exam they I'm don't not care interested. no they don't care <laughs> and we've we've got a program um called rse which is relationships and sex education it's really good program and it's really important but there's no exam and they and sometimes they'll say why do we have to do this if there's no exam right. there's no grade yeah. Isn't that an interesting kind of idolatry where the whole purpose of school is the interior formation of a human soul and that interiority is immeasurable. It's observable, but it's immeasurable. And we have transferred the value of an education to something external, like a test. And it's become for us a kind of idolatry so much so that you hear this all the time, even in the States, if it's not on the exam, I don't need to know it. Mm -hmm. If that's true, then we're in a lot of trouble. That's a, that's a terrible thing. Yeah, how have we got here to this place where the exams, it's like an exam factory. I mean, yeah. education wouldn't have begun. The vision of education, the vision for the human person and flourishing wouldn't have begun with the end being the exam. How? That's right. But the long answer begins in the garden with the sin of our first parents. The slightly, long, slightly shorter answer is we could look at nominalism of the 11th century. But if you want to make it sort of simple, we can go back to the mid-19th century Prussian model of schooling, the kind that uh, John Dewey in the United States of America kind of inculcated into American education, which is very similar to the European education, where experimental psychologists, human people who had become thoroughly secular humanists, had rejected the notion that we can know true things, rejected the intellect, rejected free will, and instead said the end of education is for the sake of society to form citizens to solve the problems of the state. And in doing so, this materially reduced education made us focus on things that are material. And a grade uh, or an exam is a material manifestation of supposedly the work you do in the school. And so that's the exclusive focus. In fact, really, there is an implicit rejection of free will. There is an implicit rejection of the intellect if they say something like objective truth doesn't exist. 
and there's no objective moral standard. So they've rejected the human soul. And in the rejection of the human soul, all you have left is the human body. And with the human body, it's all about measurables. And so the test becomes important. But here's the real bad thing. In our case, in the United States of America, our tests come out of animal behaviorism. The multiple choice test was something like a rat in the maze goes through and has three possible choices. If he picks the right choice, he gets the cheese, right? It's a really, it's a real, really reduced notion of how did you come to discover what another person knows? A multiple choice test. It really is rooted in animal behaviorism. And it's, it's a tragedy, treating people like animals at best. Wow. It's no wonder I know homeschooling is on the rise over there. And I think I looked up today, um, I don't know the exact figures, but I think it's risen something like 75% since the pandemic. Um, so I think people are wanting to restore their children and educate them at home. Uh, but this idea of objective truth is really at the root of a lot of problems in our culture, isn't it? I was in a meeting mm -hmm. um, not so long ago, and it was about racial justice. And I made the comment that I believe in objective truth. And, it, and <laughs> one of my colleague said so do I but what's objectively true for you is different from what's objectively true for me <laughs> oh and, my. and I thought we don't even really understand what we mean you know when we're talking about objective truth and then yeah. someone else said you know if you we don't want to end up like ISIS I thought is this serious that that me making a very very simple and basic statement that I believe in objective truth and that God's created us and has revealed is somehow so extreme really Makes you a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> right. right? Uh, the first calling, that's absurd. It's embarrassingly absurd. Uh, and what you generally hear is this. Look, there's no such thing as objective truth. You have your truth. I have my truth. And what the person saying that doesn't realize is that that is an objective truth claim. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a contradiction. But here's the thing that was abandoned. There is the first principle of all reality. And that principle is the principle of non-contradiction, which says that a thing can't be true and not true at the same time under the same conditions. Or a thing cannot be a thing and not be a thing at the same time under the same conditions. This has been utterly rejected. And until we recover that first principle of all reality, there really is no real conversation, as you noticed with your colleagues. There's no conversation there. If you believe in objective truth, you're, you're pretty much a terrorist. Yeah, but it's or really white difficult. supremacist. <laughs> Yeah. Right. It's really difficult because you want to dialogue and search for truth together. Right. But you but the problem is the terms themselves have been so manipulated and that That's right. you're, you're no longer talking about the same thing. You think you are. I think I am. Right. But I'm not. You are not. <clears throat> and they'll tell you you are. They'll tell you, even though we're saying completely different things, we're saying the same thing. And they're OK with yeah. that. That's what I've heard from. The dialogues I've tried to have. Very complicated. Yeah, it's really difficult. But again, I would say the 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 formation of teachers for Catholic schools is so important because it, it shouldn't be that you're having general conversations and these are, these very basic things are news to to people. Because over here we in our Catholic schools, the teachers when they're interviewed just have to say that they're always asked, will you support the Catholic ethos? And so they always reply, yes. And, you know, God bless them. They, these are lovely people. These are good, nice yes. people. Yes. Um, but what is that yes and answer to? It, you know, if, if I went to teach at a, another faith school, a Jewish school or something, and, and they said, would you support the ethos? And I said, yes. I should really know what that ethos is before I say yes. Yes. So yes. it's communicating what that is, is so important. Yes, it is. I, I have a personal response to somewhat of what you're talking about. Um, I just got a new job. I'm the executive director of the St. Thomas More Fellowship in Boston, Massachusetts for the Archdiocese and Catholic Schools. They are as in much, as in much trouble as the next guys when it comes to having faithful Catholic schools, but the superintendent and the assistant superintendent are super faithful. They're really great souls. And we are working on this project where we're going around to these faithful Catholic colleges, and I'll name them Thomas Aquinas College, Wyoming Catholic College, Thomas More, U uh, University of Dallas, Franciscan of Steubenville, and Ave Maria. We're going to these schools, and we're recruiting faithful seniors 
to come to Boston and to participate in a six week teacher formation program that my wife and I are designing. And we're going to put these kids into these good schools under faithful principles. And we're going to try to rebuild our school culture by forming our teachers in the authentic arts of teaching in theology, philosophy, the liberal arts, and then the sciences. That's our plan. That's fantastic. I heard you um, speaking with Matt Frad last week about the roots, the need to change the roots. Yes. You can't really deal with the fruits. That's right. But you have to look at the roots. Yeah. yeah. Now, that's a really important point because the fruits are made. We, we, in materialism, in secular humanism, we give ourselves the impression through scientism that we can take an apple and change it. Mm. And it's just not true. You can plant different seeds, but you can't change the apple. You can ruin it. You can make it rotten. Yeah. But you can't change it. But you so. And so what, how do you go about designing this program with your wife? If it's six months, did you say? It's six weeks. I wish it were six months. It's, it, we're calling it a teacher boot camp. Yeah. But what we're doing is we're addressing all the aspects of, of what you need to be successful. And that's intellectual, it's spiritual, and it's practical. So we have different components in each one. I'm doing the history of education, the liberal arts, philosophy, logic, recovering those. My wife's working on classroom. I'm doing a thing on classroom leadership. My wife is doing classroom setup, lesson planning, and all these other practical things. And um, it's all about virtue and and cultivating the order of loves in in the city of truth. That's what it's all about. Yeah, there's a there's a great couple of schools here in London that have recently opened up, um, probably in the last 10 years. And they are PACT schools. So it's this organization called PACT, Parents and Children and Teachers in Partnership. Ooh. And yeah, they're really good from what I've seen of the, the education. So it's underpinned by the Catholic faith and the educational vision of St. Jose Maria, St. Jose Maria Scriba. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, it's really nice. good. And they have as part of their um, curriculum this eudaimonia program, mm. which is great. So It's got all these different lines. It's not just a set of lessons, but a way of learning which takes the interconnectedness of knowledge really seriously. Good. And it runs and they have, you know, different talks and different lines, the philosophy line, not dissimilar to what it sounds like you're you're doing there. That wouldn't be dissimilar. Yeah. And the eudaimonia comes from the Greeks, meaning a good lasting spiritual value. It's it's, and it's talking about virtues. Yeah. And that's one thing that's not in the conversation, the public or the modern school is that there's no objective moral standard, therefore there's no virtue, even though they have new modern virtues like tolerance and equality and liberty. Those are things that are put forward today as virtues, but the way they're put forward are not virtuous at all. Um, So yeah, to recover that sounds great. And in this partnership, I'd be very concerned to see if they get the right order where they put the parents or the primary educators and we teachers as partners are assisting and serving parents mm. in the formation of their children. I hope that's the way it's going. It, pro- it probably is. It does seem to be, yeah, that recognition. Right. Of, and, and in fact, they put on periodically at various weekends through the year parents conferences. And they get the parents in and they do some sort of looking at different different speakers in to talk about different problems, maybe face it that the teenagers face. So they're very much in touch with the parents. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, it's a really it's a really good vision. That's um, beautiful. Yeah. So there are good things going there on. There are good things out there. Yeah. Absolutely. There's several. And and the increase in homeschooling that you mentioned. Um, I don't remember the numbers, but it's increased tremendously here too. I was hoping it would increase more, but it's really difficult in this age. Society's been engineered to to make both parents work. It's really tough. It's really tough these days. So there are some encouraging things though. Yeah, yeah well, mate, I think the thing is people have to get sick of something, don't yeah. they? they? They have to kind of recognize, and it's not just Catholic parents. I think there are, you know, non-Christian parents who are also getting fed up. Yes, uh, I think so. Many, many of them. Thank yeah. goodness. Yeah, the more yeah. the better. You know, one thing I wanted to mention too, and I think you alluded to this, is that the modern school, by its very methods, by its very theoretical underpinnings, they mean to divide the child from the parents. And bringing in that author and reading garbage like that, that uh, the, the perversion of the Lord's Prayer, that divides children from their parents and from their faith. 
And these are the kinds of efforts you see in the, in the modern school. They mean to divide the parents because they need, they need the new kids to do the state's bidding. And it's a tragedy if the Catholic schools follow suit. And unfortunately, many of them have. So mm. really problematic. What do they want? Because it's all, it's, it, that will always be under the guise of just trying to be, like you say, tolerance yeah. and, and kindness. Um, That's what they would say. Yeah. But it's really about power and control. And if you can confuse somebody into thinking that niceness and tolerance are the highest things while they absolutely excoriate anybody who disagrees with them yeah they want you to believe that they want you to buy into that contradiction you will be canceled if you're not nice that's what they'll say they say we're the most tolerant generation in history and we're not putting up with this it's kind of the contradiction yeah it's, it's terrible a bit, it's a bit like some of what i'm seeing coming out of the u.s at the moment with um in response to the Roe v. Wade stuff that we're hearing about, yes. um, and the that I don't know how prevalent it is, but the people daubing horrible graffiti on on churches and storming yeah. into churches, right? And you think this isn't nice behaviour? And also, <laughs> I don't I don't totally understand. Maybe I've misunderstood, but isn't it just hasn't it just been a bit of a Pontius Pilate decision to kind of hand it back to the states? And yeah, it, it's not saying no one will ever have an abortion. No, no. Unfortunately, no. I, it's so complicated, but no, it's just handing the power back to the states to decide locally, um, which is a step in the right direction, I suppose. But the problem is, is that we're already so deeply entrenched in this idea that, that we want to convince women they have a right to murder their own children. It's just an unbelievable, it's, it's diabolical, it's Luciferian, it's satanic. It's literally the Antichrist to say, women, murder your children. It's a right and it's a good. Uh, so we're in so deep. It, it really does. The, the law is the fruit, right? The law is the apple. Give the apple back to the states. That's great. But it doesn't change the apple. The law is evil to begin with that allows that kind of thing. So we have root work we must do. We must change hearts and minds about what the human person is about the truth, about human dignity, and about the value of each innocent life. That's where we got to begin, really. Yeah, and to tap into that desire to do the right thing and to be nice and to be kind, but just yeah. to get young people to see that that begins when our life begins, when a unique life begins. Yeah. Because I agree, it's just absolutely, that's another thing you can't say. If you say that you're pro-abort, pro uh, if you say that you're pro-life, that's another thing, a big no-no. Yeah, big no-no. Even in, even amongst Catholics in Catholic schools. Um, That's right. That's right. And I want to push back on nice a little bit. I had this wonderful priest explain to me that the Latin origins of nice is really a kind of ignorance where you don't know something. Is oh, okay. And you just go along with it because you don't understand. Um, kindness is, is a virtue. But more important than that is telling the truth with charity. If you, you know, I love what you wrote in your, your introduction on Catholic speakers about thinking that Jesus is a, you know, this nice dancing hippie type that loves everybody and lets everybody do what they want. But the truth is, you can't forget that when Jesus scourged the guy in the, in the temple selling, selling goods and he called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. I mean, this is very serious business. No one can characterize that as nice, but you can characterize it as charitable and true if in telling the truth about this, we have an opportunity to reform or to conform ourselves to the will of God. So I think nice is a, a pretty dangerous word, but yeah, I think we ought to be truthful and charitable. Yeah, absolutely. It's so much, it's so much more than nice. And that's my stock line, actually. I'm afraid I've probably overused it, but it's, it's for me, that was reading the gospel, really reading the gospel, not just knowing mm -hmm. a few little passages that everyone knows, the Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son, all of these fabulous teachings, but in isolation, but really right. getting into the gospel and getting to know Jesus and realizing that Jesus was, well, Jesus is God, you know, and, and it's, I wish people would just go and read the gospel because yeah. sometimes people will say, well, Jesus wouldn't do this or Jesus wouldn't do right. that. And right. I want to say, well, what, well, what are you basing that on? Have you right. read the gospel? Like <laughs> people, I've said before, and we, we've all said that people don't nail nice guys to a cross. And, you know, mm. some of the passages, you know, better a millstone tied around your neck than you, um, 
lead any of these young people astray. That's tough. That's really tough. That serious business. That's my guiding principle. Yeah, absolutely. It should <laughs> yeah. be all of ours. Um, For school teachers, that ought to be our thing. Don't mislead the children. Tell them the truth. Yeah. Yeah. No, that should absolutely. I totally agree with you. And that has to come first, which is why, you know, a couple of people have contacted me and said that they are in schools and they feel persecuted as Catholic teachers. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes feel that myself. And, you know, that is, it's a difficult position to be in. Yes. And it's sad, but it's why we must not waver. We must always stand in truth and, but speak charitably, um, but not be frightened because, That's right. you know, we, we've got to trust in God that, that yes. he will give us the strength to, to cope. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of the time because we're, we're for some reason I'm on a time limit here on my recording I want oh. to I know um I wanted to say to you that I went to a barn dance at the weekend and it was fantastic do you know what a barn dance is no so what it, is that? It, it's a it's a traditional dance where people go into a hall and there's a caller and he tells you the moves that you will do and all the women line up on one side and all the men line up opposite and he gives you a run through and then they play music and everyone dances in formation. And it was so it. lovely. It was so there were old people and middle aged people and children stepping on each other's toes. And mm. it was just so lovely. And I spoke to the organisers and they said they were Catholics and they said they had read an article about what John Paul II would do in difficult times. Mm -hmm. And it was all about community, probably not unlike um, Rod Dreher's Benedict. Um, mm -hmm. Benedict option. Benedict option. Benedict option. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just so beautiful. So that is beautiful. Do, do you think there's something to be said for that? Getting oh, certainly. families together, certainly. doing. Absolutely. Drawing us back into community. The big push with technology is to get everybody on those screens and focus on their own lives and radical individualism. There's a there's a very serious need to recover the gold standard of the family, which is mother, father, biological children, that's the building block of civilization. Uh, but again, society says your family's an anchor to you. That's not true. You, your, your service to the family for the sake of the common good is the thing we need to recover. It is the thing. And it's true and it's profound and it's beautiful. And maybe the barn dance reminded people deep in their soul that this community is made up of families and that we ought to come together and rejoice in this life. The, gift this, the gifts that we've been given. I think it's beautiful. Very yeah. beautiful. Yeah, there's so much being done to destroy the family. The um, attacks on the family, yes. And you're quite right, because that's the building blocks. It's not individuals. Mm -mm. No. And families are being ripped apart. That's right. I, I, I think of a city of, of 10,000 radical individuals. And then think of a city of 10,000 unified, faithful, holy families. Well, one's going to be like hell and one's going to be like heaven. That's just, it should be common sense. But I ask that all the time. You know, what, what kind of people do you want to live around? And then if you can discover that and it's true, then, then that's the kind of person you ought to be. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Because another thing that I've found, um, just going back to this uh, John Fisher affair, is some of the people I've spoken to, they're young and they have no children. And... Mm they say you know we stand in solidarity with the striking teachers we we think it's brilliant to bring this material in and to bring this author in but none of them have kids and i've got right. a 12 year old boy right. and i don't want my 12 year old son to read you know catholic or not to read yeah. trashy unedifying material yeah and it annoys me that they're speaking for me and i am yeah. the parent of a child right I'm a grandfather, and at my age, I could have done without ever hearing that. That was, it was repulsive yeah. and revolting and sad and twisted and really gross. Yeah, and I'm it's sorry not, to have read that. No, I'm glad you did. Uh, I just, I could have done without it, and it, I would have been better off. It's just yeah. horrible and, and so sad for that author that, that had been given the formation where he thought that was okay. Mm. It's really, really sad, isn't it? Yeah. I think so. But as you say, I think we just continue to pray. Yeah. Pray for that poor man, for sure. 
yeah and uh and also for the for those who who book these events that maybe they'll think about trying to bring that. in you know people who may who may offer the children something more beautiful yeah. true but, but to your point about speaking for your children people do that mm. and they ought to think about it because if what you read is disordered and immoral and it shouldn't be around your 12 year old the people that promote that are literally asking for the millstone or literally saying i'd be better off with a millstone around my neck because i'm willing to destroy innocence and, and damage the fabric of reality it's really gotten to that point so how do we talk to those people yeah i don't know i don't know i don't know the all the answers that just um <laughs> sorry about that i don't know what happened hey i'm so sorry i that never happens i'm not sure what's going on i'm not particularly technically minded so if something goes wrong i i just panic <laughs> No worries. Can you pick up from that last line you were saying? I can't, I can't remember it now. And then you could splice it. You could record it, right? Yeah. Well, I can't, but I'm going to find a tech, a technical wizard who can, who can do something. I'm not quite up to Matt, Fra Matt Frad's type of, you know, yeah, his shows are good. Yeah. yeah his shows good. are really good. I'm, I'm sitting in my bedroom, just um, using <laughs> prob probably the cheapest laptop money can buy. Um, right. <laughs> but yeah. And also it's nice in your interview with him, it, just being in the same room as well must yeah. be so nice oh it's so so good compare well i enjoy this but it's better to be there it's better to be in person yeah it's funny because it, this is good because at least we can talk even though you're in the us um, right. so it offers those opportunities but there's really something about just someone every, there's so much more isn't there to just the way we move and the way that we our whole yeah. physical presence that yes. makes the conversation more natural and that's right that's right. Yeah. So I think, I'm, I don't know, I, I'm not sure actually where we left off, um, but I'm going to try and make the best of it Good. all the same. Um, so one, can you remember what we were saying? I, you know what? I, I thought we were on the family and the importance of the family, but I, I remember specifically, and then I got all cut up over there trying to figure out try, how trying to get back on. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe then I'll just ask, I'll just go one small direction and then and then we, we can finish for today. Um, the other thing over here is that we have um, students who have to get a certain level, like we call it level four in maths and English before they can do any kind of job. Um, right. And it might be in lab, you know, labor, uh, laboring, being on the building site or, or plumbing or hairdressing or something. And it, in a way, it feels like it's excluding people who will struggle to get that certain level but might be really gifted and mm -hmm. able to flourish in like an apprenticeship do you have the same minimum requirements for things over there um i mean i think we usually say something like a ged getting your high school diploma kind of allows you to do a lot of things that you can't do without a diploma but they call it the ged i don't even graduate i don't even know what it stands for uh, and then we have all our, our exams and tests, but I've been ignoring those for decades. So I don't really know what's going on with that. And in fact, I have ignored all exams for decades. Have you? Um, oh, yeah. 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 And it's, it's remarkable that my, my scholars do really well on the, the tests, but I literally ignore them. The only thing I say is that if you're going to take these tests, have the virtue to do your best. You can know what they are. They don't mean anything to me, but they, but in good faith, since you're here, take it with virtue. And uh, that's it. Amazing. And then I focus on principles of truth when I teach. So I don't, um, I don't play the materialism game or the scientism game. And, and, and then all teaching is relational. That's the other thing is it's incarnational and it's relational. And if it's not that, then it's just training, not teaching. Yeah, absolutely right. I find over here, I don't know about over there, we've got constant CPD which is called, actually, what is it? Uh, professional development, something <laughs> professional development. And, and yes. it's, it's so constant that you can't get your mind wrapped around one initiative before there's another one coming in. And it's just endless and it's too much because teachers are always pressed for time. And I think I said to someone the other day, actually teaching, I've been teaching for 20 years and it's always been about relationship. Yeah building good Truly. relationship 
truly. I'm trying to think of one professional development I've had that's been of any value in the public schools. They're universally terrible, <laughs> mostly because they say things that are false. They assert things that aren't true. It's just unbelievable how bad they are. And you're right. It's a revolving door of acronyms and changing notions. And they, they needed to be a revolving door, or a moving target, because if you sat long enough with it, you would realize how ridiculous it is. I had a great teacher once say, all these new programs that come in and out of existence, if you look at them after they die, you have a cadaver upon which you could discover the anatomy of confusion. But you'd have to take the time to look at it. And that's one thing we don't do. It's just, it's a tragedy. And it's embarrassing because they call it a profession and they call it teaching. And it's neither one. Yeah, it's a tragedy. How do you, how do you, I don't want to say get away with it, but how are you, you know, because what the way you're teaching is brilliant. I think that's that's exactly how it should be. Are you yeah. in a private Catholic school, a university, a, a state school? I'm, I'm not very welcome in the private Catholic schools. I've tried that. And um, similar to you, I've, I've been excoriated for the things that I teach. And I, I would rather be fired than not teach out of the catechism and the Bible and the church doctors. That's what I'm going to do. Um, and for years, I had to, I had to hide it. For years, I would, I would have a Greek myth book or a fairy tale book and a textbook, state textbook underneath it. If the door opened, we would switch books. The kids loved it. I loved it. And I, I did get in quite a bit of trouble for quite a few years as I was trying to sort this out. I got banned from doing music in the classroom. I got banned from teaching novels. Uh, all kinds of ridiculous things happen. I, I remember one of my administrators said, why are you allowing those, why are you imposing Homer's odyssey on your kids that's abusive? You know, and, th and there's no real answer to that other than that the administrator doesn't know what they're talking about. But it's this kind of thing that in these last, in the last eight years, I taught high school for four years and I taught middle school for four years. And I landed in a school in California that's a public charter school, John Adams Academy. And I didn't have to hide what I was doing from them. They actually really liked it. They liked it so much that they made me a mentor teacher. And so my job the last few years has been working with teachers to help to draw them out and disentangle all these secular humanist ideologies and inculcate in them the desire to be myutic about their teaching, which means to be a midwife, to not oh, suffer the, that, that means... As a school teacher, the best analogy is midwifery because a school teacher is not the efficient cause of learning. What we do as myotic teachers is we help to birth concepts into the souls of our learners. But we're only instrumental and influential, not efficacious, or we're just not the cause of it, if that makes sense. Yeah. So teachers are taught to overvalue their role and undervalue what they really should be doing. And so it's been really joyful to work here at John Adams Academy in California. You'd be shocked by how wonderful it is and beautiful. It's a public charter school. And, I, and they allow me to be Catholic there. They told me, we don't want you to leave your spirituality at the door. Bring it in and, and be fair with everyone. Understand the true nature of freedom and the liberal arts. And we use classics. It's amazing. It's an amazing school. Wow, that sounds, I love that about the midwife, that root word of, of midwifery. Yeah. That's yeah. brilliant. And that you found, I, I don't know what a charter school is. I'm not sure if British people know what that is. <laughs> I'm not sure I know what it is, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's a public school that's not run by the state. It's run by an organization that writes up a charter, submits it for approval, and a local school district will either approve or not approve it. If they approve it, then they can run for a certain number of years. And ours was founded by a really good soul named Dr. Dean Foreman, who studied philosophy and for his family, his children started this school because they did early homeschooling. He and his, his lovely wife, uh, Mrs. Linda Foreman. And it just grew. Now it's three schools big. There's four or 5,000 people on the waiting list. It's, wow. and it's, it's an American classical school that has these core values that are grounded in objective truth, reality, and beauty. One of them is we respect public and private virtue we say they're they're the same thing there's no distinction yeah. private and public virtue that's one of our core values it's beautiful yeah it's really we, beautiful. we've got to have this tell us haven't we we've got to say what you know that child in front of me needs to we have to try and prepare them for heaven 
That's right. We have to try and That's prepare the telos, them for, yeah. for sainthood. And That's so right. that should direct all our, everything we do. That's right. And the modern school rejects the notion there's a telos anywhere, telos. They reject that notion. There's no final causality. You're supposed to be what you want to be, which isn't true. They also say there's no formal causality, meaning there's no right way to do things. They reject both of those notions, and that makes it impossible. Those two things, formal and final causality, we need a telos. We need that. Or, or to discover what it is. We don't get to make it up either, which is ironic. The world says, yes, you do. You can be whatever you want to be. That's that's simply not true. <laughs> I know. It's and then, impossible. And then we, when we live like that, we see the problems. And then we decide to solve the problems with the same poor choice that we made in the first place. You That's see right. that all the time here. You say, we've got a problem. Um, you know, women aren't safe on the streets. Um, there's misogyny. We, so we'll solve it by um, giving more sex education, uh, giving out condoms, mm -hmm. keeping... And it's like, you, what? so we're not going to solve it by teaching yeah. young men about self-control and young women about um forming Virtue, good habits and good virtues and having self-respect and and respecting the dignity no we're not going to do any of that we're gonna look we're gonna look to the culture which already caused the problems it's so incoherent oh it's it's contradictory it's like you said i remember the colleges there's rape culture on campus and then to respond to it they promote feminism and the right to wear whatever you want and the right to, it's just, it's, you're absolutely right. The, the solution increases the problem. Yeah. That's the way of the modern world. That can be said of pretty much every government program. The idea of equality where you punish virtue and reward viciousness doesn't solve the problem. It makes it worse. Mm. Yeah. And that's the mindset of the modern secular humanist agenda, which is Luciferian at its roots. Yeah. And if you try to say anything again, so I, I think I've said before about modest dress, but as soon as you try and get even to begin a conversation, it's you're trying to tell women what they can wear. Uh, and I think, but actually, if you just look at life, if you just look at reality, there is always a public and a private in your home. You've got the kitchen where people gather, but not everyone piles into your bedroom That's and right. eats food in there. In a school, you've got the head teacher's office and then you've got a classroom and, and it gets smaller and smaller towards the private space. Yeah. And so our bodies, it's perfectly fine to see my hands, but there's parts that are private. And I, right. and we see this through all reality and that's yeah. normal. But as, normal. Any, as soon as it's about the body, it's I've got to do what I want and, you know, be yes. who I want. Yes. Yeah. It's so sad for young ladies because the very thing they would like the most to not be objectified is the very thing that happens when we promote this kind of false freedom, freedom from moral convention or from the virtue of modesty, which is really much more beautiful than its opposite. Yeah. It really is. And so it's, it's a sad irony. And, and most women have fall for it. And if you think it's tough for you to talk about modesty to girls, imagine what they say to me. You're a guy. You don't know what you're talking about. But yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I'll Partly that's why I wanted to do what this sort of thing, which I'm still trying to learn the craft and it's quite difficult um, mm -hmm. to do. But, you know, I speak to people and they say, well, I'm not going to listen to the patriarchy. I spoke to someone today who said they, they're a Catholic and they said, um, I, I don't like the way the church is just an oppressive patriarchy. And right. then if I would say speak to a priest, they'll say, well, he's just part of the patriarchy. That's right. So you can't. So then I felt, well, I'm a lay Catholic woman who happens to see that the church is beautiful, that the te teachings of the church are beautiful. And so perhaps, I'm not really sensing it, but perhaps as a woman, maybe I'll be given a little bit more, more leeway to, to say those things. But Or maybe be more attacked because you've aligned right. yourself with the enemy. Yeah. I've seen it both ways. <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah. Because the funny thing is, these are just excuses not to listen. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest teachers of all time, St. Augustine, he said, when you learn in it, when you're in a classroom, uh, you don't need to worry about what the teacher thinks. You need to ask the question, is what they're saying true? That's all that matters. Nothing else matters. In fact, he has this quote. He says, who is so stupidly curious to send their children to school to learn what the teacher thinks? Nobody. The job of the teacher is to proclaim and profess truth. The job of the student is to listen and evaluate. And if what is said is said truly, to applaud. That's what Augustine says. It's very beautiful. 
It's beautiful. And it seems like a really beautiful note to end our conversation today. Um, Stephen, thank you so much for joining me, for taking the time. I really do appreciate it. And I hope that we can catch up again and all the best for your um, programme that you're developing. Um, and I'd love to hear more about it down the line. Well, thank you, Catherine. And you keep up the good fight too. I'm very impressed with the work you've done. Thank Let's you keep, so much for having me. Keep one me. another in prayer. Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. okay. God bless, God bless you. you.